just just pipe up. But so yeah, for anyone tuning in, guys, welcome. I'm Cody McKibben, and I'm joined today again by my good brothers here, Rico and Eric, from the Hero Foundry, and we are on a journey. We're we're reading through Joseph Campbell, the Hero with a Thousand Faces. How's your guys' reading coming along? Have you been reading ahead a little bit? I did a couple. I bet about uh, a chapter ahead, Cody. Cool. Yeah, well, I, haven't, yeah. I haven't really been able to get get enough free time in the last couple of days to read any read any more. So I'm kind of where we currently are at. Well, no worries, man. That's what we're here for. We're gonna go through it together. So I think when we last left off, let me just see. I think for you guys, it's probably about page fifteen. Is that right? So, you know, we were, we're in the myth, or excuse me, myth and dream, the prologue about the monomyth. And uh, so far, you know, he's gone into several kind of dream readings, linking up, um, uh, I guess, psychology with mythology. And I know that he kind of opened up the story about the Minotaur and Theseus who enters the labyrinth, right? Um, right where we left off, there was actually, you know, we wrapped things up, but there was a, there's an epic footnote that I think I want to start us off with today. And Campbell was just saying in a, in a parenthetical, um, talking about the archetypes, you know, in our mind. And the, the archetypes that often show up, I mean, you learn about them through, re through reading myths or, you know, hearing these stories, but they also kind of reflect in the, the symbols or the imagery of our dreams oftentimes. Um, so let me see. You know, the, yeah, this was kind of where we left off last week last week, but uh, Campbell's saying, the first work of the hero is to retreat from the world scene of secondary effects to those causal zones of the psyche where the difficulties really reside. So, you know, the inner world. And there to clarify the difficulties, eradicate them in his own case, and break through to the undistorted direct experience and assimilation of what Carl Jung called, quote unquote, the archetypal images. So the footnote, to go along with that on my page is about, it's a page and a half. <laughs> so let me just dig into this. Forms, this is footnote 18, I think, if you guys have it. Uh, forms or images, so he's saying the archetypal images. So what are archetypal images? They're forms or images of a collective nature which occur practically all over the earth as constituents of myths and at the same time as autochthonous, autochthonous individual products of un unconscious origin. So again, yeah, they, they, there's the collective unconscious where we have these archetypes, you know, these, and the, the characters, the heroes, the, the, the monsters, the minotaur, you know, these, these represent something. And, and then they also show up as archetypes in our own thinking and in our dreams and in our psychology. Um, so he's kind of uh, referencing, yeah, Jung's book, Psychology and Religion. <clears throat> he says, as Dr. Jung points out, the theory of the archetypes is by no means his own invention. Compare Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche says, quote, in our sleep and in our dreams, we pass through the whole thought of earlier humanity. I mean, in the same way that man reasons in his dreams, he reasoned when in the waking state many thousands of years. The dream carries us back into earlier states of human culture and affords us a means of understanding it better. <clears throat> it's from Human All Too Human, Volume 1. Uh, then he goes on, Campbell goes on, he says, compare Adolf Bastian's theory of the ethnic elementary ideas, which in their primal psychic character, corresponding to the Stoic logo, logo I, I think that's how you say that, or the, I believe that's the plural for logos. Logoi spermatikoi. <laughs> Should be regarded, so I, I'm thinking that means like the truth that comes from uh, spermatikoi, <laughs> like uh, conceptual, yeah, 
conceptual truth that comes from within. Uh, <clears throat> the elementary ideas, which in their primal psychic character should be regarded as the spiritual or psychic germinal dispositions out of which the whole social structure has been developed organically. And as such, should, should serve as bases of inductive research. Compare Franz Boas. Since Waits's thorough discuss, discussion of the question of the unity of the human species, there can be no doubt that in the main, that in the, main the mental characteristics of man are the same all over the world. Bastian was led to speak of the appalling monotony of the fundamental ideas of mankind all over the globe. Certain patterns of associated ideas may be recognized in all types of culture. So again, just like all these thinkers throughout the past have been pointing to the fact that like, yeah, there, there's, we have our own unique stories depending on what culture and you know, what tribe you, you come from, what nation, etc. But the um, the the arc, the underlying archetypes, the symbols, really, there's there's a similarity across cultures across the world. <clears throat> and he goes on again. Compare Sir James G. Fraser. We need not, with some inquirers in ancient and modern times, suppose that the Western peoples borrowed from the older civilization of the Orient the conception of the dying and reviving God together with the solemn ritual in which that conception was dramatically set forth before the eyes of the worshipers. More probably the resemblance which may be traced in this respect between the religions of the East and West is no more than what we commonly, though incorrectly, call a fortuitous coincidence. The effect of similar causes acting alike on the similar constitution of the human mind in different countries and under different skies. That's from the Golden Bough. Yeah. Any any thoughts on that? It's it's like he's almost there pointing out. Yeah. We we there's like an underlying framework to the universe, if you will. You know, like to uh, obviously how the human mind works. But yeah, as it relates with the world and the the patterns or the progression of life you know it, it kind of between those the inside and outside forces it creates these these patterns or this framework and so you have a similar journey showing up in all these different myths in all these different uh, stories and religions and and so on so he goes on again compare sigmund freud well, I recognized the presence of symbolism in dreams from the very beginning, but it was only by degrees and as my experience increased that I arrived at a full appreciation of its extent and significance, and I did so under the influence of Wilhelm Steckel. Steckel arrived at his interpretations of symbols by way of in intuition, thanks to a peculiar gift for the direct understanding of them. <clears throat> Advances in psychoanalytic experience have brought to our notice patients who have shown a direct understanding of dream symbolism of this kind to a surprising extent. This symbolism is not peculiar to dreams, but is characteristic of unconscious ideation, in particular among the people, and it is to be found in folklore and in popular myths, legends, linguistic idioms, proverbial wisdom, and current jokes to a more complete extent than in dreams. It's from the interpretation of dreams. Dr. Jung points out that he has borrowed his term archetype from classic sources, Cicero, Pliny, the Corpus Hermeticum, Augustine, and so on. Bastian notes the correspondence of his own theory of elementary ideas, as he calls it, elementary ideas, with the Stoic concept of the Logoi sper Spermaticoi, <laughs> the tradition of the subjectively known forms is in fact coextensive with the tradition of myth and is the key to the understanding and use of mythological images, as will appear abundantly in the following chapters.
any thoughts from you guys? You know, so he's yeah, he's really he's showing like yeah the sh the the shoulders of, who, of of giants that he's standing on. Kimball is Carl Jung, Bastian, Nietzsche, James. Like they're all been, they're all they're all you know they're generally talking about the same thing. If you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, like it's there's a what's the word I'm looking for? You know, there's a not a stream of consciousness, but kind of, you know, in, in their own words, they're, they're all talking about the same thing. To me, like reading that. Yeah. It well, it almost is actually. I mean, uh, you should you should at least relate it, yeah, to stream of consciousness because it it's like it's coming from somewhere deep in in our psyche. You yeah. know. Yeah. We're all it's not even. If you know what I mean, like uh, if you want to get into the woo, -woo stuff, like when I yeah. read that, that's what I kind of get from that. You know. I mean, like all these, like Nietzsche. I'm not sure the timelines of these gentlemen, but I'm sure they're all around the same time. But they're all basically saying the same thing. Mm. So, like, well, yeah, I think I'm not familiar with the, you know, when a couple of these guys were around. But yeah, I know Nietzsche was, uh, I believe, you know, 1800s. He's the one who predicted the death of God right. and not like uh, I, I, Jordan Peterson has said, like, his interpretation is that he didn't really mean. There is no God necessarily, but at least culturally, we've eliminated him, you know, like we've decided we don't need that idea anymore. And then he, he actually predicted what's now happening. You know? he, he predicted that like by removing this underlying structure, kind of this, this psychological framework that we built Western society on, that it was going to lead to just wars and the division of, of society and, and basically like our moral uh constitution would crumble and you know it's really fascinating because yeah he, he actually predicted the 20th century you know last century very accurately where, where we had like you know at least a hundred million people killed by by mostly uh communist but tyrannical regimes you know and um and yeah just this division which kind of seems to be coming to a head now in 2020 um but I, I, what I find really fascinating is, you know, whatever your personal, like your spiritual or religious beliefs, like I do think all these guys who are really approaching it from a, from an academic standpoint and from a more, most of them from a very psychological perspective, but they are saying it's like, yeah, these, these are the underpinnings of our culture. And almost it's like, like they, these religious ideas are, are, they're natural for human beings, you know, they're, they're, they are a part of our psychology and it's, you know, whether they're literally true or, or the, the, uh, I guess the relation to the, the <clears throat> material world, like that's kind of up to you, but at the very least, all these guys are pointing to the fact that, that there is that similarity, like every culture throughout history has had some some, for lack of a better word, some religious um, framework, you know, some conception of how the world works. And that maybe, like, the, the archetypally, like, yeah, we need that. Cody, I don't know if you've seen, uh, speaking of this, I don't know if you've seen the, the series called American Gods. No, I've heard of it. It's, it's basically... What you what we're just going over it's basically what that the series is about you know like the new gods are the internet and i can't remember exactly and then the old gods are like um um odin that sort of thing right and it's the battle yeah. between you know like people are lo losing the religious framework you know what i mean and the old gods want to bring that back so it's kind of interesting when like reading this because I, I haven't seen the series for a bit, but a couple of years ago I was watching that quite, um, quite a bit, and that it just reminds me of that. That's the reason I'm bringing that up. It's kind of like the war of the spirituality of people, right? Um, mm. Yeah, it sounds interesting. I, yeah, uh, I, I would have yeah. been checking it out to be honest with you. you might I mean, so, so yeah, like that. That's that's a great segue because it's like yeah, it's almost as if 
in the last hundred years or so, by and large, yeah, we have kind of because because I guess of the scientific revolution and like yeah, at least as far as what you can actually see with your eyes and what you can point to, you know, and touch like in the material world, a lot of people. I mean, even people who do label themselves religious don't. Maybe many do not quite treat the the, the symbols or the 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 myths with the same reverence, I would say. But yeah, it's weird how it's almost been replaced in modern day culture by, you know, the titans of industry, by entrepreneurs sometimes, by these tech giants, by, I mean, it's, it's interesting, you know, or, or, or sports idols, right? Or celebrities and movie stars, of course. It's like, yeah, we put, now we put actual human beings on the pedestal oftentimes, yeah. you know, and we look yeah. to them as our, our saviors. I was thinking about that yesterday. It's like so many people in the world are, everyone is looking for a savior, I think, you know, somewhere deep down inside, I guess myself included. And, uh, you know, whether you can admit that or not, but I do, it's like people seem to be looking for, like, who is the person that's going to make the world a better place? And, it, and we, we tend to look outside, you know, we don't think of like, oh, I could be that person, but we look outside, we look to the successful, the wealthy, or the popular, you know, the famous, and, and we do really, I, I think, I mean, there's nothing wrong with people who are successful and wealthy and famous, but, but that, that habit, we tend to like, uh, we tend to really idolize, yeah, and pedestalize people, you know, and, and, well, that's what that and series. forget that they're human too, you know? <laughs> yeah, and that's what that series is about. Like, I can't remember, the, it was called The New Gods, or was the internet, and... I can't remember. There's a couple of other ones. You know, the old gods. They mm -hmm. get their power from people's faith, right? Right. So, yeah. I can't remember exactly how it went, but they were going to go, there was going to be a war mm -hmm. between, you know, the old gods to bring back the way it was against the, you know, the, the new gods, per se. Mm -hmm. you know, it's pretty interesting. It's, it's talking, like, it's reading this, it just kind of brought that up. So, mm -hmm. you might want to check it out, man. I think you'd like it. Yeah, sounds good. I'll, I'll definitely yeah. look into it. I can't remember if it's on Netflix or what, but it was, you know, I think it came out maybe three years ago, the first season. So, cool. Yeah. Nice. Um, yeah, but, uh, you know, for, for anyone who watches in on this, it's like, I, I just want to point that out. Like, I I know a lot of a lot of people are turned off by just the idea of quote unquote religion, right? But at the very least, I think that, uh, uh, it's so it's so important just to look at it at least if not for anything more just for the symbols you know and for and and look at it as archetypes like maybe you can't you, you're not uh you don't believe in like the physical reality of these like characters or these stories but you know may there there's still some some wisdom, you know, in the, the patterns, in the dynamics, and in the journeys they go through. There's still some lessons to be learned that for eons have, like, kind of in, in, informed humanity, you know? And it's like, yeah, it's it's no wonder that uh, basically every great civilization that ever rose up, you know, had some kind of uh, mythical story behind it, you know? And, and, and who knows? I mean, as, as we get into this book, I think, I think we'll... Obviously, we'll be unpacking that idea more and more, but uh, but but perhaps you know those those stories are um, may, maybe you know it's it's like they came out of our unconscious, they guide us, and maybe we don't need to uh, to trash them if we can look at them at least as valuable archetypally, you know, and psychologically. Does that make sense? What I'm trying to say there. <laughs> So, okay, so that was like one epic footnote, but let me pick up where we left off last time. Um, okay, so back to Campbell now. The archetypes to be discovered and assimilated are precisely those that have inspired throughout the annals of human culture, the basic images of ritual, mythology, and vision. These eternal ones of the dream, quote unquote, which is going to have another footnote. I think that's from Gezerohim. Yeah. 
an Australian Aranda term, which refers to the mythical ancestors who wandered on the earth in the time called something ancestor was. Anyhow, uh, these eternal ones of the dream are not to be confused with the personally modified symbolic figures that appear in nightmare and madness to the still tormented individual. Dream is the personalized myth, myth the personalized, excuse me, myth the depersonalized dream. So yeah, like dreams are your, your own personal mythology, or, or, the, or at least the, per, the manifestation of it to you individually. Myth itself is like the cultural, the collective dream. Both myth and dream are symbolic in the same general way of the dynamics of the psyche. But in the dream, the forms are quirked by the peculiar troubles of the dreamer, whereas in myth, the problems and solutions shown are directly valid for all mankind. So again, like, that's kind of what I'm trying to say. Yeah, these, these, um, all these cu cultural traditions, religions, mythologies, you know, it's like they're, they're trying to describe how to, how to live properly, how to build society well, you know, how to relate to each other and, and what is um yeah what is wisdom what is honor you know how, how do you become successful really most of the time or, or their warnings you know against uh against behavior that could lead to our destruction and so i think yeah it's like we suffer if we throw them out you know the baby with the bathwater. <laughs> so to get back into him here, he says that the hero, therefore, is the man or woman who has been able to battle past his personal and local historical limitations to the generally valid, normally human forms. Such a one's visions, ideas, and inspirations come pristine from the primary springs of human life and thought. Hence, they are eloquent, not of the present dis disintegrating society and psyche, but of the unquenched source through which society is reborn. Again, it's like they're timeless, right? The hero has died as a modern man, but as eternal man, perfected, unspecific, universal man, he has been reborn. His second solemn task and deed, therefore, as Toynbee declares, and as all the mythologies of mankind indicate, is to return then to us, transfigured, and teach the lesson he has learned of life renewed. Uh, just a footnote. It must be noted against Professor Toynbee, however, that he seriously misrepresents the mythological scene when he advertises Christianity as the only religion teaching this second task, the return. All religions teach it, as do all mythologies and folk traditions everywhere. Professor Toynbee arrives at his misconstruction by way of a trite and incorrect interpretation of the oriental ideas of Nirvana, Buddha, and Bodhisattva, then contrasting these ideals as he misinterprets them with a very sophisticated rereading of the Christian idea of the city of God. This is what leads him to the error of supposing that the salvation of the present world situation might lie in a return to the arms of the Roman Catholic Church. You guys think yeah I, I don't I mean it's, it's all this you know like going back it's like no matter if you're Buddhist Christian Roman Catholic you know there's always the the, the return the resurrection whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. it's, it's a, you know it's interwoven almost in almost every story in mythology or folklore or whatever right Mm -hmm. he's, he's going over and over like it's all the same right i think that's what he's trying to get out there yeah, well, yeah at the very least at the very least it's like yeah they're they're all yeah, the same sure. thing. yeah. uh you know I, I like that uh you know he says the christian idea of the city of god or we've talked about kind of like the archetype of the kingdom or you know if you could, some call it the kingdom of heaven or whatever but yeah like like or, or, you know, they say the new Jerusalem or, or whatnot. But, uh, yeah, even the Buddhists is like striving towards nirvana or paradise. It's like, what is this? I mean, and you see it even in politics, right? People have their own idea of a utopia in one form or another. But especially in the mythical um, and religious 
traditions, they're all, they're reaching for the same truth, I believe, you know, they're, they're at least trying to, to point the way towards some guiding star, you know. <clears throat> okay, so to get back in here, uh, I think he's quoting a dream now. <clears throat> I was walking alone around the upper end of a large city through slummy, muddy streets lined with hard little houses, writes a modern woman, describing a dream that she has had. I did not know where I was, but liked the exploring. I chose one street which was terribly muddy and led across what must have been an open sewer. Yum. <laughs> I followed along between rows of shanties and then discovered a little river flowing between me and some high, firm ground where there was a paved street. This was a nice, perfectly clear river flowing over grass. I could see the grass moving under the water. There was no way to cross, so I went to a little house and asked for a boat. A man there said, of course he could help me cross. He brought out a small wooden box, which he put on the edge of the river, and I saw at once that with that with this box I could easily jump across. I knew all danger was over, and I wanted to reward the, the man richly. In thinking of this dream, I have a distinct feeling that I did not have to go where I was at, where I was at all, but could have chosen a comfortable walk along paved streets. I had gone to the squalid and muddy district because I preferred adventure, and having begun, I had to go on. When I think of how persistently I kept going straight ahead in the dream, it seems as though I must have known there was something fine ahead, like that lovely grassy river and the secure high paved road beyond. Thinking of it in those terms, it is like a determination to be born, or rather to be born again in a sort of spiritual sense. Perhaps some of us have to go through dark and devious ways before we can find the river of peace or the high road to the soul's destination. It's from Frederick Pierce, Dreams and Personality. Yeah, that's kind of a nice conception, huh? Mm -hmm. Going through the muck, but to find like a higher road, a higher purpose, the soul's destination. The dreamer is a distinguished operatic artist, like from an opera, and like all who have elected to follow, not the safely marked general highways of the day, but the adventure of the sp special, dimly audible call that comes to those whose ears are open within as well as without, she has had to make her way alone through difficulties not commonly encountered, through slummy, muddy streets. She has known the dark night of the soul, Dante's dark wood midway in the journey of our life and the sorrows of the pits of hell. That's something, have you guys heard that? The dark night of the soul? That's something I see come up quite often these days, especially like in the kind of more spiritual community, I guess. Dante's Inferno? Well, yeah, so, so then he, he, um, he quotes Dante here. Through me is the way into the woeful city. Through me is the way into eternal woe. Through me is the way among the lost people. Yeah, from Dante's Inferno. I guess that was words written over the gates of hell. <laughs> it is remarkable that in this dream, the basic outline of the universal mythological formula of the adventure of the hero is reprodu reproduced to the detail. These deeply significant motifs of the perils, obstacles, and good fortunes of the way we shall find inflected through the following pages in a hundred forms. The crossing first of the open sewer, then of the perfectly clear river flowing over grass, the appearance of the willing helper at the critical moment, and the high firm ground beyond the final stream which he says is like the earthly paradise, the land over Jordan. These are the everlastingly recurrent themes of the wonderful song of the soul's high adventure. And each who has dared to hearken to and follow the street call, has the secret call, excuse me, has known the perils of the dangerous solitary transit. Uh, from... The Upanishads, a sharpened edge of a razor, hard to traverse. A difficult path is this, poets declare. 
So it's like, yeah, to, to go back to that dark night of the soul, I mean, I've heard many people talk about that when they, they, they describe like a spiritual awakening, if you will, you know, like yeah, this period where they go through just a, a it's it's like your whole world falls apart, you know, in a sense. Like all all the things that you think you understand about the world maybe turn out not to be so accurate, or uh, or, or you know, it could just. Sometimes I think it happens due to some experiencing some some hardship, some tragedy, like losing a loved one, maybe, or or going through. I mean, I guess for example, like my mother, like the, I think she kind of really had a. a bit of a transformation when she went through cancer you know like if you if you really go through some extreme um, tr transformational experience like a lot of times it triggers people to like, yeah reanalyze the world and and maybe they start to find pull out these these archetypes or these these lessons you know from a, a bit more of a spiritual perspective and um, yeah a lot of people Kind of refer to that 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 real like that road of trials period as you start to to quote unquote wake up or, or just look at the world differently maybe see how you relate to everything around you see see you, you begin to really discover what power you actually have i think uh, a lot of people call that the dark night of the soul The dreamer is assisted across the water by the gift of a small wooden box, which takes the place in this dream of the more usual skiff or bridge that would get them across. This is a symbol of her own special talent and virtue by which she's been ferried across the waters of the world. The dreamer has supplied us with no account of her associations so that we do not know what special contents the box would have revealed. But it is certainly a variety of Pandora's box, that divine gift of the gods to beautiful woman, filled with the seeds of all the troubles and blessings of existence, but also provided with the sustaining virtue, hope. By this, the dreamer crosses to the other shore, and by a like miracle, so will each whose work is the difficult, dangerous task of self-discovery and self-development be ported across the ocean of life. So again, so like I just said, it's yeah. You start to almost discover those those uh, your gifts, you know, your inner strengths, what makes you unique, and and how, like in this case, like yeah, maybe you've got some secret, you know, inner weapons, almost if you will, you know, or or, or tools that will get you across that river or get you across, uh, you know, whatever dangerous foreboding uh journey you're making yeah so a lot of this was he's he's uh citing dante's inferno quite a bit here in comparing this dream uh there was a there was a footnote about yeah from from dante's inferno a little brook and i've my print here is a little messed up. I think it says the redness of which still makes me shudder, which the sinful women compare among them. Maybe comparing to the, the stream this woman crossed. And from Dante's Purgatorio, a stream which with its little waves was bending toward the left, the grass that sprang upon its bank. All the waters are purest here on earth would seem excuse me, all the waters that are purest here on earth would seem to have some mixture in them compared with that which hides nothing. And then another final quote from Purgatorio, those who in old times sang of the golden age and of its happy state perchance upon Parnassus dreamed of this place. Here was the root of mankind innocent. Here is always spring and every fruit this is the nectar of which each of them tells. So I, it's almost like pointing to the, that idea of like uh, the Garden of Eden, right? Or, or, or again, like some kind of a utopia, some, some perfect archetype of a, a place we're all trying to get to in some sense. The multitude of men and women choose the less adventurous way of the comparatively unconscious civic and tribal routines. 
But these seekers too are saved by virtue of the inherited symbolic aids of society, the rites of passage, the grace yielding sacraments given to mankind of old by the redeemers and handed down through millenniums. It is only those who know neither an inner call nor an outer doctrine whose plight truly is desperate. That is to say, most of us today in this labyrinth without and within the heart. Sorry, loud motorcycle going by. Yeah, it's, it's only those who know neither an inner call, like that call to adventure, nor an outer doctrine, which often is supplied by some religion or other, right? It's, it's only those whose plight truly is desperate. That is to say, most of us today trapped in this labyrinth without and within the heart. Alas, where is the guide, that fond virgin Ariadne, to supply the simple clue that will give us courage to face the Minotaur, and the means then to find our way to freedom when the monster has been met and slain? So he's going, he's bringing us back to that myth that he first opened in our last uh, broadcast, you know, the myth of King Minos and the Minotaur that was placed at the center of this elaborate, this, this labyrinth. So this maze, which, you know, you could almost, it's like, it, it, that, I think that kind of represents the, the soul or the human psyche too, as well as society. It's like this, it looks like a mess, you know, and oftentimes we feel like we're lost, but in, in a bigger perspective, you know, there's some order to it. There's some purpose for it. And there's a treasure to be found, I guess, if you can navigate it. <clears throat> Ariadne, the daughter of King Minos, fell in love with the handsome Theseus the moment she saw him disembark from the boat that had brought the pitiful group of Athenian youths and maidens for the Minotaur. So to go back to yeah, our last broadcast, remember, wait, Rico, what do you, what, why don't you give us a, a quick synopsis of that? Like, how did the Minotaur come about? Do you remember? Um, he was an offspring between, I think, Zeus and I can't remember the queen. Something like that, yeah. Um, then the king basically, instead of walking as a what's the word I'm looking for, he was shunned, almost like a bastard. Yeah. And he was put away because the way he he was half bull, half man. Put away in a labyrinth and became like almost like a beast that was uh um i don't know if he was a man like more man like or more animal like but i you know it almost became more you know like a savage and it was like uh for him for the king to hide his shame he put him yeah in, you know, that sort of thing right and to, well, keep yeah, bay, to keep him at bay he'd feed him virgins or you know, uh, younger um, youths or whatever. That, that's from what I remember. No, the, yeah. Uh, yeah, spot on. You got it. Yeah. It, it, the only other thing I'd add is like, yeah, I think, you know, it, like psychologically or archetypically, archetypally, like you could almost say the, the this monster, the Minotaur, was almost kind of a product of the king himself, right? Because he was off doing other things and really not, I guess like not, not paying attention to his, his wife, the queen, you know, not, not giving the, the kingdom probably the attention it needs. He became um, a dictator. I think that, I think he said, right. More of yeah. a, uh, so I think Zeus from what, you know, was punishing or come down to teach, uh, teach him something. Right. So. Yeah, so it, it was a bull. She she makes love to a bull, and then yeah, has like well, some kind of bull dance. But yeah, well, it was it was intended to be like a, a sacrifice yeah. to the gods, right? And so yeah, he was punished kind of for not for not sacrificing the bull to uh, to the gods as he promised he would. So, but yeah, like you said, it's like so they they place or the king, yeah, he placed this minotaur, which is kind of like his bastard son, in a sense, or his wife's bastard son. Yeah, at the center of the labyrinth, like you say, hide away his shame almost, right? And yeah, I guess they would they would bring shipfuls of of 
youths from uh, you know their <laughs> the the enemy empires to feed this thing. <laughs> yeah, he couldn't bring himself to 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 kill it, but he was hiding it away because it it was a representation of his shame, I guess. Okay, so so yeah, so Theseus shows up. You know, I guess an Athenian. It seems like uh, from um, on a boat full of youths and maidens meant to be fodder for the Minotaur. So, and Ariadne, his daughter, the king's daughter, fell, falls in love with this guy, Theseus. She found a way to talk with him and declared that she would supply a means to help him back out of the labyrinth if he would promise to take her away from Crete with him and make her his wife. So, so it sounds like the king is going to be doubly punished here soon, huh? The pledge was given. Ariadne turned for help then to the crafty Didalus, by whose art the labyrinth had been constructed. Didalus was the guy who, yeah, built the labyrinth, designed it. And Ariadne's mother enabled to give birth to its inhabitant. Didalus simply presented her with a skin of linen thread, which the visiting hero might fix to the entrance and unwind as he went into the maze. So. There's almost a parallel there to, uh, what was it called? The two, the brother and sister who go off into the forest and they leave bread, breadcrumbs. Hansel and Gretel. Uh, yeah, Hansel and Gretel. But yeah, he's got like a string basically so that as he goes into this this maze, you know, he'll be able to, to follow the string back out thanks to the king's daughter. <laughs> it is indeed very little that we need. But lacking that, the adventure into the labyrinth is without hope. So yeah, like she almost like if I guess if he's the hero in this story, Theseus, going into the labyrinth to uh, to face this this beast, this uh, you know this human gobbling <laughs> uh, terror at the center of the labyrinth. Like in a way, she's one of the. Um, Maybe not the mentor, but like that's kind of almost the, the meeting with the goddess, right? She supplies him with with a, a tool to to help him on his journey. Okay, next paragraph. This one doesn't quite make sense to me. Is this right in your books? Is this the little is close at hand? Yep, I have that too. Okay. All right. So I guess. Yeah, same here. I guess he's saying, you know, what we need is little, right? Yeah. Sometimes it's the smallest thing that that is like the key on our journey. So I guess that's what he means. Yeah. The little the is problem. close at hand. Sorry. The key to fix the problem is actually very simple. Yeah. Exactly. Most curiously, the very scientist who, in the service of the sinful king, was the brain behind the horror of the labyrinth, quite as readily can serve the purposes of freedom. So yeah, Didalus, who, who designed the, the labyrinth, like kind of turns around and then helps the princess, you know, help Theseus to, to kind of, I guess, unlock this riddle, right, or break this spell. But the hero heart must be at hand. For centuries, Didalus has re represented the type of artist-scientist, that curiously disinterested, almost diabolic human phenomenon. Beyond the normal bounds of social judgment, dedicated to the morals not of his time, but of his art. He is the hero of the way of thought, single-hearted, courageous, and full of faith that the truth, as he finds it, shall make us free. And so now we may turn to him, as did Ariadne. The flax for the linen of his thread he has gathered from the fields of the human imagination. Centuries of husbandry, decades of diligent culling, the work of numerous hearts and hands have gone into the hackling, sorting, and spinning of this tightly twisted yarn. It's like, yeah, I guess he's kind of saying, if you think about it, like, it's a simple little thing, but in the grand scheme, like just the, the existence of such a thing <laughs> as thread, you know, it's, yeah, it, it's the product of, like he says, centuries of, uh, of people raising animals, you know, of, um, 
working and like what how do you make thread you know you need like a um a spinning a yeah a loom thank you so you know how many countless people did it take to kind of design that to figure out that process it's like it, it's something even though it's a simple little thing and it took one guy to hand i guess the princess like this thread which was the key for theseus it also like it's almost inherited from our ancestors if that makes sense you know it's like something that took almost the whole community originally to, to formulate you know to come up with this this uh this tool that we now have <clears throat> yeah to create th this tightly twisted yarn furthermore okay so here's one here's one for the history books this last little bit on this first chapter is uh, one of, I think, one of Campbell's greatest posts ever. Furthermore, we have not even to risk the adventure alone, for the heroes of all time have gone before us. The labyrinth is thoroughly known. We have only to follow the thread of the hero path. And where we had thought to find an abomination, we shall find a god. Where we had thought to slay another, we shall slay ourselves. Where we had thought to travel outward, we shall come to the center of our own existence. Where we had thought to be alone, we shall be with all the world. He's very good. <laughs> yeah, I think that that one almost in in. Uh, you know the guy. Yeah, he certainly has a way with words. It's it's a little hard to decode sometimes, but that was two complex sentences. But like in a succinct, yeah, half a paragraph of that that pretty much encapsulates what the hero's journey is. You know, it's like, yeah, the challenge is the labyrinth. You know, like that. That's a representation, I think. Yeah, of of each of our individual. Um, you know, you could you could call it the the path of spiritual growth or or intellectual growth. It also maybe represents, yeah, how like it it appears like if you don't if you're not Didalis, you're not the guy who, you know, designed the thing. Like it, the it, society itself almost or the world looks like a mess. You know, it's confusing, and you go in there, and you'll get lost, and you might get eaten by the Minotaur. <laughs> But, but there is an order to it, you know? And so I guess the, yeah, the task of the hero is to like go navigate that, you know, and find your way through it. And, and as he says, it's like, yeah, you know, at the center of this labyrinth was a, an abomination, at least that's what we think, you know, a, uh, a centaur actually, yeah, real quick. So for those watching, here's a, depiction of Theseus slaying the Minotaur from this myth. But, you know, it's representative of really uh, confronting, I guess, the shame, the, the things that are hidden away in the shadows and, um, and summoning the, like, like, yeah, we're all waiting for someone, you know, who's courageous enough to, to do the right thing, I guess, you know, to go confront what is scary, what is um, what most of us shy away from in order to kind of uh, revivify the the kingdom, you know, the society. But yeah, what do you guys, what do you guys think about that on the whole, like that, uh, how he's kind of bringing it back to the, the myth of the, the Minotaur and especially that last couple sentences. I love that. What are your guys' thoughts? Yeah, the last the last few sentences was nice. Basically, the way it seemed is just finding or bettering yourself, I guess you'd say. Getting, overcoming whatever you believe is, I guess, hideous and, and working on it or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think it's like in our myths, we often represent these things, you know, like often through violence, right? But it's it's not really saying like we need to go out there and, you know, charge literally against an enemy and slay them. It's really it, it, they're they're typically stories about an inner journey, but but told through 
symbols through archetypes right and like I mean especially a, a thousand years ago maybe people didn't have the intellect to tell that story from a from a, a psychological perspective and so but we but we we distilled these these grand ideas yeah into more simple folk tales essentially right so that they could be passed down but but it really it's like a it's telling you you know yeah have courage young man you know yeah go confront your demons or, or whatever it is that's that's hidden away and and uh, maybe undermining your society your culture you know so there's something something rotten right like kind of at, at the center and it always needs um to be confronted and whatever is wrong needs to be righted and yeah through that that process you you often find it's like yeah maybe what you thought was whatever that that thing that represents fear the abomination he says like where we had thought to find an abomination we shall find a god like it it, it spins the whole thing on its head it's like it like when the world is upside down if you're the one who can have the courage to confront these things like you can spin it back right side up i guess in essence i like the way he leads into the you know he, it's he's very good give him that <laughs> you know you know like the like the strand is you know I'm giving you i'm giving you the, the tool that's what this book is to me you know when i read that I'm yeah giving you the tool to navigate anything like whatever maze internal maze um you know uh life it's like a guidebook for life almost to me you know reading that because i've read ahead a little bit so i kind of know what's coming but you know he's giving you he's giving you the tool and it's the hero's journey right you know um the framework i should say so i bet yeah. it's up to you to uh if you want to get through that maze you're gonna have to you know um not slay the minotaur but you're gonna have to confront you know um your demon mm -hmm. and uh it could be the best thing for you yeah so yeah i love that really move forward yeah. that sort of thing that's what, you know, like it's pretty interesting how he leads into that. It's very good. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good, a good observation. This book is our thread, right? Like. <laughs> well, it, it, it's. I was kind of wondering where he's going with this, but then you read that. You know, I didn't catch that the first time, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, it's very interesting. Yeah, we we have only to follow the thread of the hero path, like he said. It's like it's been it's been tread by. By countless heroes, you know, of many stories, of many traditions, many people. Right? That's what, uh, yeah. yeah and we, we all have our own unique journey, you know, to go on, our, our own unique uh, dragons to confront. But, but yeah, underneath it all, there's this similar, uh, this thread, this, this path, you know, or, or, or at least kind of a, a road map. So that's what, yeah, the hero's journey kind of blueprint shows us. This is, these are the general principles, the archetypes, you know, this is the, the, um, the cycle, I guess I, I would call it the cycle that a hero goes through or that, that anyone goes through really, you know, the, the hero doesn't start out a hero, you know, <laughs> the hero does usually start out like just a scared little normal average Joe, right? And like through circumstances, it's like yeah, you gotta, you do need to choose courage at certain points, but they're they're almost forced into their their adventure, usually at the outset. And and it's through that process of like going through this cycle, like eventually it transforms them into a hero by the end. But yeah, like you say, yeah, we're not alone. It's like, it, it's it is basically it's like i've said before it's like a, it's a map for the human experience you know and yeah you can you can dive into it with all your heart you know and and kind of accept the challenge gladly 
Um, or you can, yeah, like be dragged into a kicking and screaming and maybe not get so much out of it and resent the whole process. But in many ways, it's like, yeah, life takes us on, on a journey. And, and I do think this, this monomyth framework really, really reflects in, in all of our lives in one way or another. Yeah, you take the words out of my mouth, Cody. I'm like, it's like a blue uh, blueprint for the human experience. Like that's exactly how I'm, you know, feeling and thinking. You know, I'm not well read, but that's exactly that's the words right there, man. I think it's it's pretty interesting. The more you get into this, yeah. makes you think. Absolutely. I mean, and I think you said last time, like, yeah. Uh, you, you told me. I know you're. You'd gotten pretty deep into the book, I believe, before we started yeah, I, I, going over it together. It's it's, it's different now because we're actually, you know, I read it, but I didn't really read it. You know, it's kind of little. I thought, oh, this is a little bit over my head, but he, you know, the, you know, sitting down with you guys and going over it and kind of, you know, mulling it over. It's 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 pretty interesting. It's really interesting. Yeah, you know, e even like some of the stuff that's going on in the world, you can kind of see, or the movies that are coming out, or the movies that you've seen. You know, it's all follow this kind of the mono myth. Yeah. Um, you know, like Dune's coming out. I've seen that show a million times. I read the book. Same thing. You know. Yeah, I'm excited for that one. Yeah, that looks awesome. 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 So, should be good. You know, I, I, what you mentioned. That's kind of the way I felt. I would read over it. Like I think I went to the first, just the whole, just the prologue, but not really grasping or understanding everything. So, so hearing hearing everybody talking about talking about this and kind of helps helps bring it down to a level. I guess I can understand easier. Good. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's great to like sit down together and you know we can all share our, you know, fill in any gaps right and and kind of bounce ideas off of each other but i mean yeah it is it is leagues deep you know like and the the things that i mean yeah just the references the footnotes in this book are incredible i mean if you want a classical education like seriously guys you know start with this book and then and then start just going through all the footnotes and read all those books and you'll have like the deepest understanding of of at least western civilization but but as he also gets into you know like he quoted here from the kata upanishad which is like a hindu um scripture you know, you know it says in one of these footnotes here um well, so yeah actually i'll just share, unless otherwise noted my quotations of the upanishads will be taken from robert ernest hume the 13 principal upanishads translated from the sanskrit so the Upanishads are a class of Hindu treatise on the nature of man and the universe, forming a late part of the orthodox tradition of speculation. The earliest date from about the 8th century BC. So, I mean, yeah, he's drawing from, you know, things, what, what is that, 12, 1300 years old from, from the East, you know, from um, the Hindu tradition. Yeah, Dante's Inferno and Purgatory, the Divine Comedy. You know, there, there's a uh, yeah. It gets really deep, and this stuff goes way back. But it's so fascinating, right? How he, he really traces, like you can see the the origins in in all different societies across the world and throughout history. But then it, it kind of brings it all together. It, it is, it's like this, this um, psychological unification, at least, of, of all, like, what are these traditions, what are these myths trying to describe or, or showcase for, for their culture, you know? Like, yeah, each one, each one, like, in context, it may look very different, you know, because it's a product of its time and place. And so they're all dressed up in different uh, costumes, I guess, but but there's so many similarities, so many parallels, which is what just, when I first read this, it just blew my mind, you know, it was like, wow. I mean, I do, you know, I, ha I have my own tradition and I, I love that one, but but I think it's, I think it's so important for people to, to see, to see this, really, to see Campbell's work specifically because he's, he's pointing that out. He's like, you know, yeah, we're each different and unique, but hey, like, really guys underneath it somewhere it's like we're all kind of the same you know everybody's striving for 
for the same things. You know, everybody, most everyone is like just trying to live as good a life as they can. And, you know, everybody wants to be loved. Everybody wants to thrive, you know. So I think like that's something like especially today like what do we what's the message we're getting bombarded with constantly it's like the opposite you know it's like everyone else out there sucks you know they're idiots and they don't have any idea what they're talking about <laughs> so it's like we're being really divided well it's like everything's reversed right now like we've talked about this before that's how I feel everything's reversed you know the fake the fake is worshipped and the real the truth people don't want to deal with. So, you know, they'd rather go on Instagram and, you know, it's a bunch of fake, you know, to me, that's just the way I look at it. You know, it's not real. You're not dealing. I don't know. Like, like this whole Corona thing, I've said this before, I, you know, it's like, I don't know. It's making us kind of wake up a little bit and uh, see, you know, the world as it really is, to be honest with you. It's, I think we're going to come out better. Um, but yeah, we're going to have to burn it down. I think, I think it's coming. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, like, I mean, so again, it's like, it's reflected in that hero's journey concept, right? It's like, there's some, some overwhelming tragedy or, 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 um, it's like, you know, it's something like, like it's Corona, Corona. That, that creates all this fear, and it's panic, even, but it's it, just, like really, you flip it around it's an opportunity for, for transformation yeah like it's not even the it's not even the virus it's just it, it it's shown how do i say this it's shown you know how what how like reality almost a little bit now you know the most important things have been taken away from you you know yeah. you know and now people don't know how to deal so you know but they you know before we worship the fake you know flexing on the ground and this and that you know like and it's like that stuff is kind of not important anymore. That makes any sense. Um, I don't know. This for me, that's my own, you know, like I wasn't a big social hurt, you know, media person or whatever, but you kind of buy into the programming, I guess, you know, and it, this, this whole thing, like we, when this thing started, I was totally on board. We got to do this. We got to do that. You know, and I, I'm not going to knock anybody. You do do what you got to do to stay safe, you know, and all this, but it's like, it ain't adding up, you know. People are waking up to that kind of yeah. thing. So, yeah. I don't know. It, it's very, you know. And when I read this, it's like maybe, you know, this is how do I? What's the word I'm looking for? To navigate this, you know, the hero's journey. I'm not like I said. I'm not. I'm not here to preach or anything like that. But it's just like it's just kind of like you kind of your eyes are a little bit open now for me anyway. I'm just speaking for myself. Yeah, so. yeah. I, I think I mean the ordeal, right? On on the in the hero's journey framework, that ordeal, like that lowest pit or abyss that we we find ourselves in, it it uh, in this case, it's it's exposing the cracks in society, yeah. right? Or the like, cracks in our own way of looking at the world and life. Like this is okay. This me and Cindy talked about this. It's like. You know, I, and I'm not preaching. This is not, you know, there's consequences. They kill 68 billion animals a year. Like, I'm, I'm not here to preach. You know, we don't look after the environment. And I was never this type of person. But it's like now there's going to be consequences, right? What we're seeing mm -hmm. now is, I think, nature getting back. You know, like you can only, like we took this place for granted, your life, your freedoms, everything else. And it's like we're being exposed to you look at the fires going on in California, in Oregon. Yeah, yeah. You know, like nature is gonna, you know, you, you, you're, you're, it's like not payback, but it's like there's gonna be consequences, right? Right. Yeah, I, remember, I remember reading a thing, and I don't know if this is true, in 2050, there's gonna be no more fish in the ocean. And I'm not here to preach or anything like that. Like, there's consequences, right, to your actions. And I think, no, this preach on, brother, preach on. <laughs> Well, like I, I was never this type of person, but it's like this kind of thing is opening up my eyes a little bit, right? Yeah. And you know, like I said, you, you kill. And my, I, I, you know, I love animals. I eat meat. You know, I've, part of me feels guilty now. You know, like you know, sixty-eight. They kill sixty-eight billion animals a year. Like you, you don't think there's going to be consequences? Like nature is going to 
he's going to get you, you know. Yeah. Um, global warming, you can be on, you can believe it or not believe it, but look what's happening, you know. Um, that sort of thing, you know, like it's just opening up, you know, the, your people's eyes to what's really going on. You know, a virus, you can believe this is made in a lab or you can believe whatever. It came from an animal, but the universe is, there's no... You know, Cindy kind of got me on this. Is there's no accidents? You know what I mean? There's no accident why that's going on. You know, and it's almost like there's going to be a reset here. Well, so I, you know, I would just say, like, I I think, yeah, whatever, you, like, whatever one's personal kind of beliefs about it. I mean, like, we're each going to come up with our own answers. But like, but I think what you're pointing to here, and which what the the hero's journey concept really highlights is yeah it's like life is about taking responsibility i think this is a hero's journey for everybody yeah it's and it's like you what know, you're saying really is like we haven't been responsible we haven't been cool. like we were we blind ourselves often yeah to the consequences of our own actions and so yeah like this is gonna it, it's forcing us to look at our participation in in the problems that we face and, you know, the, the three of us and our mastermind group, you know, we've talked a, a lot recently, right, about like, like personally, yeah, I don't, I, I would heavily encourage people not to like buy into the fear stories, you know, the fear stories that society's pushing on us, like about, about even COVID, about climate change or, or, or all these different things. Like, don't be overwhelmed by, like, they, they, they often the world i'm not pointing to anyone in particular but like the world will frame things in, in whatever gets clicks you know whatever gets attention and so usually that means like what terrifies you or or makes you angry and so don't be you know overwhelmed by the fear story you know don't cower in the corner like oh my you know like the world is ending but but at the same time yeah like we definitely do need to look at yeah how are we responsible you know like how uh, yeah how am i like you say, Rico, it's like, yeah, obviously we're seeing um, consequences of things that we're, we're all guilty of. Partly, you know, yeah, guilty of. You like know, you like, like I, I, work, I work in the forest industry up here. You know, like, I, I'm like, how did I say? It's like I'm working with the beast. You know what I mean? But I well, think. we all are. That's the thing. We all are. Like, you know, it's, and I'm not here to preach and I'm not, you know, climate change and all this other stuff, but it's just like, it kind of it makes you think like, okay, I'm going to do my part, you know, to make it better. That's kind of my hero, right? What's going on right now. Like you can believe the mass, whatever. Like I, I just, it's like for me, I just want to be a better steward of the earth or what's going on, you know? Um, you know, like I said, but I feel bad because I, I do work, you know, I'm working in the forest industry to destroy trees and I'm not that type of person. We gotta, you know, I'm going to be go climb up in a tree and protest. Like that's not me, but it's just like, to me, I don't know. It's hard to explain like this, with everything that's going on, just kind of opens up your eyes to what, you know, I'm not saying this is the truth. I'm not speaking the truth, but this from my own perception right now, you know, that's what's going on with me. Yeah. Well, it's like, yeah, we are all kind of serving the beast, quote unquote, you know, I mean, society is, it's a, it's a machine. It's a perpetual, but it's breaking down, machine, you know, like this, this, what, that's what I'm trying to say. COVID is breaking, it's breaking us down. It's showing, it's showing it's all bullshit, right? Yeah. So, is. you know, and I'm not saying life is bullshit, but what I'm saying with, with society Right. With society is, you know, like the, the fake is being exposed, I guess. If that makes any sense. You know, um, you know, it's like the you, you worship these, you know, celebrities and this and that, you know, a lot of them are starting to turn because they can't tour. They can't. I just noticed they can't tour. They can't, you know, so now they're kind of speaking their mind a little bit. Mm. You know, you got. Kanye West urinating on his Grammy, you know, people ought to think he's nuts. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? But he's like, you actually think, you know, why is he doing that? Because he's, I don't know. It's hard to explain. It's like it's symbolism. <laughs> you know, this bullshit that to me, 
you know, I don't think like, a lot of people think he's nuts, but then you got his wife, you know, is it, I'm going to, I was on the news. It's like, okay, I'm doing, uh, I'm going to take myself off of Instagram. She did it for like 24 hours. It's a bunch of bullshit, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? To prove a point, but she was only on there for, took herself off for 24 hours. Like, it's like, we crazy, you know? I don't know, maybe yeah, call yeah, me crazy, course. but we'll make, you know, like when I read that, I just like, yeah, he's, a lot of people think he's nuts, but, you know, maybe he's the same one. We're all crazy. I don't know. Well, that's, a, a, you know, it kind of um, brings up in my mind another thing we, we, we touched on recently in some of our private calls is like uh, we're addicted. You know, we are. We're all addicted in some ways to things that are destructive, you know, for ourselves or for society at large. And it's like, and that's always been the case and it always will. You know, it's like you can't complete like like we're we're made up of like both good and evil, you know, on the inside. Yeah, sure. The Christians sure. say we're sinners, you know. Um, who, what, what was it? Uh, Solzhenitsyn says, you know, the, the the dividing line between good and evil goes down the center of every human heart. And it's like I, I don't think you can really have a, a realistic perspective on life until you accept that. It's like, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I'm guilty, you know. And you can't completely obliterate it, you know. Like, let's all strive to be as to be better yeah uh, like, but, like, like that, that's why it is the, like the 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 labyrinth with the the monster you know the the um the centaur at the center is all it's a representation or a symbol for society itself too you know and it's like even like think about the book of genesis you know even god's perfect little garden paradise you know what was at the center <laughs> a serpent you know tempting us <laughs> and and which the thing that led to our downfall it's it's interesting but i i think it's like that those are archetypes and they there there's truth in it and there always will like yeah we're always going to be contributing to um to our own district to, to to we're going to be contributing to the things that yeah are destructive in the world but it doesn't mean we shouldn't strive to to continually revivify and be fixing those things and going in a better direction. If that does that make sense? Yeah, it, you I know, think it's really, Sorry, go ahead, Cody. Well, you know, you you get your idea in there first. I'm going to say at least like the things that are important, which we thought were important, are not important now. You know, if this COVID whatever's happening, like in Australia, it's like the things that we took for granted. No, those are the important things. So if, if and when this passes, I think people are going to realize, I would hope, you know, what's important now, you know, your family, your freedom, your freedom of movement, freedom of thought, freedom, you know, it seems like everything is trying to, and I'm not saying just COVID, but everything, you know, is, it's like they're trying to control us a little bit, you know, and you can take that as you will. You know, I, I don't mean, you know, mind control or MK Ultra and all this other stuff, but it's like, I don't know. It's I feel like it's breaking down and people are just don't know what to do. And that's why all the confusion and everything else are going on, the protests and the anger and the, the hate. It, it just, it's like, it's not society is breaking down, but I think people's constructs of what they thought was normal is not there anymore. And they don't know how to deal with this. Yeah, yeah. So, and the sad thing is, is how easily everybody is willing to be controlled. Promise their protection and everything like that. Take away your freedoms and everything. And oh, I'm safe. And, and uh, stuff like that, you know. Yeah, it's like, but I think the people that are like that, I think they're generally good people. And but they think us doing that, things are going to go back to the way they were, and they're not. Like they're not going back. It is my, it's my opinion. They're not going back to way what we had. So, you, you know, you can never go back. Yeah, you can never go back. Like travel. Okay, this is because me and Cody have traveled. It's like, you know, that could be that could be years, if ever. No, you know, like to go to the Philippines now or whatever. Like, say I want to travel. Like, do I need a vaccine? Do I need like? It's like, do I? You know. Yeah. It's kind of freaky because I love traveling. That was kind of my thing before all this thing was going to happen. Well, happen, right? So I don't know. I don't think people, you know, a lot of people are can think the way they think, and I'm not here to knock it. But it's like things are not going back to where they were. 
I think it, it goes back to like a page or two prior where he said the multitude of men and women choose the less adventurous way of the comparatively unconscious civic and tribal routines. Like you, you can know, read like, this whole passage and that's what's going on right now. Yeah. You know, Minotaur is COVID or society, however you want to look at that, right? But the, the maze is what's you know, life right now. Yeah, yeah. So... But that's the thing. It's like there's always going to be a centaur, you know. Even like the hero goes and slays it, and and so for him, like he's achieved his, I guess his duty, you know, in a sense. He's made his transfer, his personal transformation. He's accepted responsibility, right, and done something about it. He's done what was in his power to to help make the world a better place. But but mythologically speaking, like. You could you could almost you could you could visualize it as like the moment he did that, you know, another centaur manifested in, in its space, you know, for the next generation to have to come along and deal with. You know, there's all it's there's always some crisis in the world, and we're never going to be free of yeah. that. You know, like that that's what the world is like, and that's why I mean personally, yeah, it's like I I look at it as a, life is a spiritual test or game, I guess if you want to put it that way, and it, without that that crisis or that that challenge you know there there is no game right like there would be no point to be here really if there weren't if there weren't fears to confront and and uh you know yeah bad negative destructive habits that we have to overcome so i mean yeah it, it's it's really i think it's really fascinating especially like as we get d deeper into the book like the yeah the hindu tradition especially has some pretty eye-opening ways of kind of conceptualizing that that idea that like there's just this ever perpetual like like that's that's the world we live in you know it's it is yeah. it's it's both creative and destructive you know and we will never be able to do away with the destructive side entirely it's yin and like, yang right? yeah there's always going to be good and you're going to have the bad right yeah. that's just the way things are that's nature you know it's like, okay, because I'm a big movie guy, you go to the force, right? Star Wars. You know, when Luke's training Ray, because I just watched that the other night, you know, he's like the three things. I can't remember exactly, but that life and death, good and evil, and I can't remember the other one, right? There's always, there has to be balance. You know, when, when things out of balance, then there's going to be issues, problems, right? Yeah. One way or the other. So, you know, nature's balance. And I guess that's what I was, the point I was trying to make. Nature is going to balance the, the scale here mm -hmm. you know, with everything that's going on. And I really believe that. So, you know, I just hope people, you know, do the right thing in your own way. And, uh, yeah, get through this. You know, like my hero's journey for this, I was really thinking about this last night. I want to detach from the matrix, right? Get onto my business, get onto, you know, that sort of thing. I don't want to depend on society, you know. I want to do my own do my own thing so that's kind of where i don't want to be dependent on that so yeah yeah well yeah it's, and that's the thing it's like i mean society needs those masses you know the multitude of men and women who choose that less adventurous path because it it needs that we need that but yeah for some of us i think it's like you, you and that that's what i would say it's like yeah they're on a journey a hero's journey of their own too it just might not be as grand a scale or whatnot and they may remain unconscious of it like he says because routines but yeah. for some of us it's like yeah like we maybe we we want to take more responsibility for ourselves you know and we want to um be more intentional about leaving some kind of legacy or, or trying to just achieve a little bit more with what time we have here, you know, to try to make things better. Especially but when you got kids too. Like I don't have kids, right? Like I couldn't imagine like you and you and Eric, you know, what's going on. I, even with my brother, he's got like we were talking the other day and it's like his kids are bummed out. Like his dad. Yeah. You know, and it's like I don't know. I'm kinda I'm trying not to give into the fear, you know, kinda that's not me, but it's like I don't know. I hope I hope uh, I don't know. We'll see what happens. Well, yeah, with a baby on the way, little baby yeah. girl in two months. Um, yeah, it, it does. 
you know, I'm grateful for it actually. But you know, at the beginning of this crisis, I was just thinking, yeah, this is not the world I want to raise my children in, you know. But I'm grateful that it, at least that just the fact that that is part of my life, it it, it gives me more oomph, you know, more fuel. It could be a better world, Cody. That's the thing. It, it could be better. It could yeah. be awesome. You know, things could change. A lot of things could yeah. change. Well, I, and I think it will, yeah, as long as enough of us take responsibility, you know, mm -hmm. in whatever way we can, yeah, and do do what we, whatever, it's like, that's a, that that part has to come from inside each one of us, you know, it's like, and I, I'm, I'm personally, I'm kind of, I, I really try hard to avoid telling people what specifically they should do, other than just look inside, you know, you know, what is your soul telling you, what's your heart telling you, what's the thing you know, really deep down inside, even though you might kind of, be, be in denial of it sometimes, but I think that there, there is. There's that little quiet voice deep, deep, deep down inside of each one of us that's telling us what we should do, and many of us ignore it, you know, but, but yeah, life is like about, well, the hero's journey at least is about having the courage to to answer that call, you know, <laughs> yeah, and, and to take take full responsibility for as much as you can, and that that's how we revivify our world, you know, at least our what what's in our sphere of influence but yeah it's like it's like pushing a, a rock up a mountain a boulder you know up a mountain <laughs> but that is life um yeah if you guys have any concluding thoughts i'd love to hear them but i do think yeah that completes that first uh part of the prologue and then and then next time maybe we can delve into the next section which is called tragedy and comedy if that sounds good since we've already gone over an hour but yeah what do you any last thoughts from you eric or you know any other uh insights this this has given you guys so far no not 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 anything new um is there are several challenges I'd like to overcome as well, and and uh, I believe it could be applied to this hero's journey. So I'm excited to keep going forward with it. Yeah, yeah, me too, man. Well, yeah, I'm I'm deeply honored to have you guys involved in all this stuff that I'm working on, you know. And yeah, like, feels good to have a couple like-minded friends to 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 embark on our individual journeys but you know kind of alongside each other because yeah it's gonna it's unique to each one of us we're not we're not each trying to conquer the same things but at least we can kind of yeah share stories and encourage one another along the way right yeah yeah sorry i was trying to stay off the mic most of the most of the time my wife's been on the phone with her mom and for some reason they always talk so loud <laughs> <laughs> Hey, it's the Filipino way, you know. Welcome to Asia. Well, say, say hi for us, man. Uh, Eric, when what if about you, you? If I ever get over here, man, it's the noise. I don't get it, especially in Thailand. Uh -huh. and it's like they're so you. It, it's I don't know. It's loud. You get used to it. Yeah. It's well, like I, I spent I spent nine months in the Philippines, and uh -huh. uh, it was it was noisy noisy but it was a different way of life different it was a whole new perspective on things and it was, a whole, it was, it was a, yeah what's up it's energy that's what i feel like i'm over there i, I i'm not a big yeah. person but when i was over there it's just like you kind of feed off the off the energy especially in bangkok like if you you know i'm not a big city guy but it's there's something about that city is pretty cool yeah totally well, there, so. I'm, I'm a i'm a small town person and uh, there's this market over there in in uh in uh the philippines and it's called a kugan market over there in Cagayan de Oro, mm -hmm. and uh crowded like so packed full of people the stores you got enough for, like one basket yet you got like 10 people right trying to get by each other at the same time and and you know i hate crowds but it was such a neat experience <laughs> yeah yeah, it's good to dive into those uncomfortable experiences at least once in a while, huh? <laughs> I think I'm like you, Eric. Yeah, I mean, I spent, you know, almost two years in Bangkok, which, yeah, like you say, Rico, it's, it's got a very interesting energy, and it's it was fun at the time in my youth, but, yeah, I'm more like I want to be out in the, you know, the silence of the countryside is what I like. 
but uh but yeah it's always interesting diving into other cultures and places that make us you know that stretch our comfort zone right um well yeah let, I, i'm gonna wrap it up here in a second but if you guys would stay on with me and we can do a little logistics afterwards um but before i end the broadcast rico do you have any other concluding thoughts no i think i pretty much ranted <laughs> went on a little bit there so that's you know i'm glad we're doing this at this time i think it's good therapeutic a little bit is it yeah. actually you know like i said there's so much crap out there and it's just it, it kind of cuts through that a little bit you know and I, that's it's calming a little bit yeah for me yeah. anyway me too buddy yeah Sorry about all the cats here i got animal farm <laughs> Well, yeah, thank you guys for going through this with me and for those watching. Yeah, so that concludes the first section of the prologue, Myth and Dreams. Join us next time and we'll dive into tragedy and comedy. So, yeah, thanks for watching. See you next time. I'll just end this.